I need to hit the record button. Um, because I just we'll... did. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Andrea. Okay, so just a quick introduction. My name is Hannah Nordby, and I am the Area 5 Program Coordinator. And um, today, one of my helpers is Andrea Bowman. Um, she also helps out with the Soil and Water Conservation Leadership Academy and um, helps support soil conservation districts across the state. And we were wanting to just kind of provide some sort of supervisor training throughout the summer in these busier months. We felt like a leadership academy would maybe be um, uh, not the best timing. There's a lot going on in the summer, and so it's hard to um, ask people to take time out of their busy schedules to come to an academy. But we were hoping that by hosting a handful of these webinars, we can still get some relevant information out to folks and kind of just get you in and out in a timely fashion. So what I'm going to do is I will share my screen here and... Um, And we'll pull up our PowerPoint. Okay, perfect. So like I said, uh, today we are going to be focusing on urban conservation education. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to be doing a handful of these um, like, um, Leadership Academy short takes throughout the summer. And so in July, we'll be talking about ballot requirements for elected supervisors. In August, it'll be reviewing financial reports. And in September, um, we've got Rhonda with the North Dakota Association of Soil Conservation Districts. And she's gonna be sharing about some resources and the 2024 convention update. Um, for each of these segments, we have kind of, um, I would say specialists that really know the topic well and can provide some pertinent information. I threw a QR code up on the screen so you can take a picture of the QR code to sign up for future webinars. And then just as a reminder of other ways that you can obtain your supervisor training requirements is we have Agriculture Applied, More Than Dirt podcast, which is a super easy way that you can um, kind of listen in on some up and coming conservation practices or ideas that could be applied to your local district. Uh, we have recordings of webinars you can browse through and also those micro lessons that are recorded. Again, that QR code will take you to these different resources and I just hope that you know we're going to be in the tractor more and maybe with auto steering you might have a little bit of time where catching up on a podcast or a webinar might be relevant. Um, but without further ado, we are going to jump into today's topic, and I have a handful of speakers that I'm really excited to be sharing about urban conservation and how they have implemented some different urban conservation education in their local districts. So we'll start off with the Adams County Supervisor, Sean Weinert. Um, I used to be the Adams County Extension agent, and so it's nice to have those ties and fun to highlight the cool work that's going on in Adams County. We'll follow up with Billy Hinders from the Richland County Soil Conservation District. Um, and then we will wrap things up with Tokina McCary from the James River Soil Conservation. And she's an education and outreach manager. So that's our lineup. I think it you'll get a variety of ideas of different ways that you can implement some urban conservation education into your district, regardless of your um, capacity and how many employees that you have. So we'll start things off and Sean, if you want to take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Uh, um, so I'm Sean Weiner. My wife and I ranch kind of northeast of Hedinger, North Dakota. Um, we're first generation ranchers. So we spend a lot of time kind of questioning the hows and whys of things. Um, be, just because we don't have maybe that family to fall back on. So something that we've sort of taken an interest in, I guess, is soil health. And we've tried to been building our network of uh, maybe more like-minded producers. And um, so a few years ago, I just on the internet looking for 
things dealing with soil health. And I stumbled onto an organization in Montana called the, the Western Sustainability uh, Exchange. And if you guys haven't looked into that, it's it's a pretty neat organization. They do meetings all winter long on Tuesdays, just like this, ranging from financial to soil health type topics. But one of the things that they've done is this Soil Your Undies campaign. And um, when I first heard it, it kind of made me laugh. And so my wife and I decided to, to look into it a little bit. And, and uh, basically, it's a a pretty simple way to get people questioning what you're doing, right? When you tell somebody that you're going to, you're going to sell your undies, it kind of gets a giggle and, and then they start asking the whys. Um, and so it's a pretty simple exercise. You literally just go buy some cotton underwear. Um, we buried, I think we buried four pair that year tried to pick different pastures, different um, grazing environments. Uh, one pasture we were gonna rest the entire year. One had been kind of a little more intensively managed. Um, one was more of a set stock. And then uh, we buried one out in a crop field um, <clears throat> just to see the difference, I guess. So, um, and then I don't know, I guess you're kind of controlling that. If you wanted to show that video now, Sure, I think folks would enjoy it, get a smile out of them. <laughs> Why are we walking? How are we walking? What are we? Hey, 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 can you? Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> I think we're getting these off. What, are, what can you explain what we're doing? Uh, we are checking for microbes <laughs> in the soil. Yeah. And you. Stick the undies in the soil for 90 <laughs> days, and then you bring it out and... Uh, you got some tidy whities or what? <laughs> they can either be completely gone or completely there or halfway eaten. Okay. It just depends on the life in the soil. Yeah, so what are you expecting in this pasture? What do you think is going to happen in this pasture? Uh, you think we're going to pull out full undies or like Nothing. eaten undies? Eaten undies. Eaten undies? Yeah. What do you think, Charlie? Uh, probably like half eaten. What do you think, Kaysers? Uh, eat them. Eating undies? Oh. We'll find out August in August, right? Yeah. Okay. August 1st. All right, can you wobble over to Dad's digging our hole? I know I got a real kick out of that video, Sean, and I think it was a great way that you incorporated your kiddos into the project as well. Yeah, so um, we we buried them, I think it was around the 1st of May, um, and then simply we just let them sit. And I guess I should say, too, we also talked with, I think, four or five different families and um, had a few other people that did the same thing in different areas. Um, you know, probably up to 70, 80 miles away. And our original plan was just to get together, have a barbecue, kind of discuss what we found. And I was talking with uh, our uh, local NRCS. And uh, when I was telling Kate about what she did, she suggested that maybe we get together. Um, Hedinger has a thing called Tuesday Night Lights where the community just comes together. They roast some s'mores and have supper and, and whatnot. And so um, Kate had access to a rainfall simulator. Um, we dug our undies up, brought them. You can see them hanging in the background there behind Kate. Um, so we had that set up and then Kate ran that rainfall simulator. And, you know, just showing people in town that maybe aren't out in the soil every day that like decisions that we're making matter. Um, you know, a lot of people probably don't give much thought to what we're putting into the soil or taking from the soil or, or uh, you know, just those day-to-day -day things. And when you got a pair of rotten underwear hanging up there, I mean, people tend to stop and ask what's going on. So I guess we just found it was a pretty easy way to get, to get people that maybe aren't as involved 
uh, in agriculture to, to stop and ask questions. Um, and my plan going forward, I guess, is to kind of continue to do that year after year and, and hopefully we can continue to put on a little bit of an event, maybe tied into the farmer's market and stuff like that. So um, I don't know, Hannah, that's about all, all I got for you. I don't know what else what else you would like to know about it. I think that's perfect. I think you guys did a great job and just is a really good example of how um, supervisors can take on the role and encourage different educational programming um, and outreach opportunities. And I think this is a really great example of something pretty simple. It didn't take a lot of input costs to make this happen, but it started the conversation and is a good first step. So I really appreciate you taking the time to, to share, Sean. And we'll have some time at the end for some Q&A. So if other folks have questions, um, you can put them into the chat or hold them off, hold on to them until the end here. I would just add to Hannah, you kind of spurred me on a little there. Like as, as supervisors too, I think uh, our managers and stuff are pretty busy people and if, if we can take some load off of their plate and kind of help do some of this stuff, um, I think it's good for the district. It's good for the the district managers. And it, like you say, it didn't take a whole lot of effort on our part to get it done. So I appreciate you guys doing this. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go ahead and pass the baton over to Billy. And again, it's been a lot of fun getting to know all, all the different um, conservation employees across the state and the really cool work that they're doing. Um, it's just so much fun. And so I'm excited for you all to hear about um, what Billy has been doing, especially related to rain barrel education. So, Billy, take it away. All righty. Uh, so with our rain barrel, we started that towards the end of COVID because it was too late to start up our ladies night to get that planned and completed and going. Uh, so instead in 2021, we did the rain barrel workshop. When I say we, uh, we work with Wilkin County just across the river into Minnesota with things. We've got a lot of farmers that have land in both counties. So this works out very well for us. That way also anybody from either county could come. The first workshop that we held, we had Amanda Lewis from Clay County out of Moorhead come in and give her presentation because she's already been doing this up there. And uh, she was a really great asset. She even was willing to share her PowerPoint presentation with us. So if you know somebody else that can work with you on things, that would really help. You know, if you aren't sure that you've got enough to do it all in one county, combine with a, a neighboring county. And that way you can always have a chance at having a full class. Um, our motto here is that if we even have 10 people show up at something, it's a success because that means that the word is getting out, people are willing to learn. And it's usually word of mouth that people learn about activities and things and options out there for them. Uh, so that was, that there's Amanda Lewis. She was a hoot. <laughs> I got some pretty good snaps of her that day. Uh, also, we hold our event at Crooked Lane Farms. It's on the next slide. And uh, we, Usually we're spray painting inside instead of outside because we were holding this in April. They have a couple of big barns that we would do that in. We do this two nights to one, one night a week from 6 to 8 p.m. We do get our barrels at no cost from Crystal Sugar. They are food grade barrel. Uh, I ordered the kits from Amazon. So we basically, we charge the people 50 bucks it covers the kits and a little bit of the cost to have to rent the facility for Crooked Lanes. We create a flyer and post it to our Facebook and our websites. Um, we also announce it at our ladies night event. And sometimes with Wilka County, we get on the AM radio station, the local one and talk about it. But it's been pretty successful. We've usually got a pretty full class. And that's one example there of one of the rain barrels a lady was painting. So then the next slide. Um, so the first night we give a PowerPoint presentation about the benefits of the rain barrels. Crooked Lane also goes over the different types of paints and clear coat to use. Then we sand the 
the barrels down using two tony grit paper and wooden, wooden blocks. And after sanding, we clean with a vinegar water mixture. And once that's dried and the holes have been drilled with a hole saw that comes with the kit, so we do supply all the drills, uh, then we spray with primer paint. And that's our first night, pretty much. Then the second night, we let them apply their own design. Uh, after the paint is dried, they load them up to take home. It's not gonna be 100% dried and cured. So we emphasize that they uh, get their own clear coat and apply it at home along with installing their kit. And the kit does come with really good instructions for them to follow at home as well. Um, so then we've got on the following slide, some pictures of completed rain barrels. Um, you know, you see we got everything from your barn quilt designs. Some people do windmills with their family or their ranch initials on it. Um, we've got one lady, she was a retired art teacher moving out to Otter Tail Lake, so she did an otter. Um, and the one down the bottom right is the one that I actually did, and my husband finally got it attached this summer. Um, but so that's up and getting this current rainfall we're getting. But those are just some examples. You can apply different uh, shrubbery if you want. Even you can get fake plants or you can put real plants up and spray paint around them. That's all all different options. The Whatever your imagination is, that's the limit, you know, so. And then after that, a uh, couple of years ago, we, um, Wilkin County and I, we discussed and we thought it would be really fun to have a pollinator night. You know, pollinator's been a really big push, especially with urban conservation lately. And we found uh, an idea from a county in Minnesota. Ours is not nearly as big as theirs. It's a huge huger community, a bigger community, and they have breweries, local breweries and everything that we don't have. But we do have um, in Richland County a winery. So we are called, we called ours Buzz and Wine Pollinator Night. Again, it's held out at Crooked Lane Farms out by Colfax. I get speakers in. Um, we have a little activity like making seed bombs. And uh, Paul, we have our tree guys there from both counties along with North Dakota Forest Service. We have in the past gotten Pheasants Forever there and uh, Agassiz Seed, who's our seed rep usually to discuss their different options that they have as well. And then the Cricket Lane Farms has the wine there for sale through the local winery. Um, last year we had April Johnson, the NDCU pollinator technician speak about edible trees, shrubs and plants and things that they can have that she, you can keep smaller in your smaller backyards and towns, different options and how to set it up and how to manage them. Um, this year, I'm currently lining up the different vendors and booths to be there and trying to finalize a topic and speaker for our educational value. And I just, I wanna note that, you know, I work part-time technically 35 hours a week, but, by combining with another county, helping split the load, I can still do all of this stuff along with any educational outreaches at school during the school year and get everything planned and ready. And it's it's not it's not too taxing. You know, sharing some of the duties with somebody else really does help. You spread the word and before you know it, everybody's wanting to show up. We changed our time this year to be from 6 to 8 p.m., for the buzz and wine pollinator because the last two years we heard people saying they wished it was a little later so they can make it there earlier after work and see the whole get through the whole thing and hear the speaker so that's one of the things that we're changing for this year and those are some pictures from the last couple of years um the first year we ended up having to have in september was a little windy and chilly La last year and this year it'll be at the end of august and so the inside of the barn there and the outside areas is what we have set up. But that's pretty much it. Awesome. And Thank you. I'm oh. willing to share anything with anybody if they need some assistance or want a PowerPoint or whatever. So. Yeah, I've already leaned on Billy a little bit. We had some other districts that were interested in um, doing a rain barrel workshop. And so I had reached out and um, Billy was really great about 
sharing the PowerPoint with me and all the resources. And, and I think that's the great thing about soil conservation districts is they're really willing to lend a hand and help each other out. Um, it's the camaraderie is second to none, I would say. So thank you, Billy. Um, we're gonna move into having Tokina kind of wrap things up. So Tokina, I'm gonna pass the baton to you. Okay, awesome. So today I was invited on um, to this session just to talk a little bit about some of the pollinator plantings that the James River Soil Conservation District did. And just from, I'm not an expert by any means, but just some things that did and didn't work for us so that if any other district is thinking about doing this, maybe this would be helpful. <laughs> so um, you can go to the next slide, Hannah. Uh, we're located in the southeast part of the state, and recently our district was able to purchase the old nursery grounds. So we had applied for a trust through the association in 2023, last year, and this was one of our components, was basically to attract people from town back onto that property because it hadn't been used in so many years. And so my goal was I needed something that was easy to maintain and it needed to look nice really fast. <laughs> what everybody wants, right? <laughs> so you can go on to the next slide. So I decided to take a little bit of a different approach. Um, so we've all seen pictures where like people scatter the wildflower seeds and either you get this amazing mass of beautiful wildflowers or it just looks like a disaster. And I thought, okay, I can't handle that. I had too much on my plate last year. So we took the approach. Um, we made smaller pollinator beds is what I called them. And we actually, instead of doing it from seed, we purchased plugs and we utilized the fabric um, to our, our purpose behind that was to help control some of the weeds because we knew that we were going to have weed issues. There were Siberian elm trees out here that were freely giving their seeds to any bit of open dirt. So this was our approach. So these are just some pictures from last summer when we started installing um, what it looked like after we um, completed the installation of the plugs. And then if you go to the next slide, Hannah, um, just kind of a picture of what it looked like. Uh, this was probably late summer. So things grew and like insane. I've, I never expected them to grow so fast from these little tiny plugs that we got in the mail. And so we had 100% survival last year. Um, it did look a little rough, just we had some really windy days and stuff like that, but we still achieved our purpose of getting our plants to grow and to be able to show things when they were actually flowering. And then if you go to the next slide, I have some pictures that I just took last week. Uh, so things again have just really flourished and we have things blooming. I bet we were just really happy. We did look, it looks like we lost a few, maybe um, four plants, but um, I was pretty happy with that. And then if you go to the next slide, it's just another view of what these pollinator beds kind of look like in what we call our backyard area. So it's really meant for people to come, to walk, to look. We have all the trees out there um, are labeled and eventually these plants will be individually labeled. So you will notice that around there we have some ugly posts and ugly netting. So that kind of leads me into my next slide, just some take home points because I do feel like this was an easy option for us to do as a district. So I have on there where we ordered our plugs from, and I understand that the fabric maybe doesn't look the greatest right now, but our intent is that hopefully in a couple of years, we will be able to remove the fabric and those plants will reseed and maybe fill in and they'll still stay contained, you know, hopefully within those borders of the landscaping brick. We had to put that netting up because even though a lot of these plants it said that they're deer resistant um <laughs> evidently after some more research so this is one of the things I learned was that they're actually are not until like a few years after they get established so I don't know if they 
eventually produce something in them that when the deer nip on them, they taste bad, but they were pulling out entire plugs like two days after we planted them last year. And it was super annoying. So, but just by putting up um, that cheap netting, it was enough to deter them, to get them um, established. And then I tried to leave it down this year and my stuff was getting nipped off right away. So we just put netting back up and, and then we don't have a problem. So uh, another thing that I would recommend is we have, I made a map of like each of these and we have I didn't have a picture of it but we have like a little information mailbox out there so that when people do come to walk they can just pull it out and there's a nice little map but I I forgot how sometimes town people don't understand like north south east west so I need to do some work on that and <laughs> make it easier um for those people and I know even individually labeling those plants will help too I just haven't got to that point and then the other thing that I learned is because we are growing them like this, um, you know, in a natural setting, there would be support from surrounding plants and things like that. And now we don't have that because they just have a hole in the fabric. So I might have to do some bracing on some of the plants that are getting a little bit larger just because we've had some really crazy winds this year. And so some of them are kind of starting to lean. And I thought, um, yeah, just for to make it look nicer, I might have to just do a little something there. So then if you want to go to the next slide. So just a couple other notes. Um, if you're wondering what exactly we did, you know, we had three different beds. That's about how much it cost last year for us. And then the landscaping brick and stuff. It took us, we worked really hard one day and just got every, we just hit it hard with like a couple of our seasonal crew members and we got it all all three beds installed in one day. But the one thing that I've really noticed is that people love to come. They love to look at the things flowering and then they pick out what they want to put in their landscape bed. And so like I've been telling, um, I had mentioned to somebody yesterday, I said, even if we can get some of these native, uh, native pollinating, hmm, native pollinator plants, um, into landscaping in small towns and cities and whatnot, we're still one step ahead um, of, say, annuals being planted every year or something that isn't attracting those pollinators. So, and it's crazy how fast they come. I mean, there's a couple little big old bumblebees and a little ant looking thing there um, on our bergamot already. So, and even in the winter, it's really neat to see how uh, the birds come and they're eating the seeds. And so, yeah, so that's what I wanted to share on the pollinator beds that we did here in the James River Soil Conservation District. Uh, the second part of my presentation, I just wanted to touch really briefly on that association grant. So uh, currently I am on the North Dakota Conservation District Employees Association and on that, I sit on the review committee for the North Dakota Association of Soil Conservation Districts. They have a committee that goes through grant applications. So if you're not familiar with this, I just wanted to do a brief rundown. Um, so every, for the last two years, the association has been doing this with, um, I think it's fun, interest funds that they have off of their, uh, off of a trust. And so they're, they opened it up to this grant process for soil conservation districts around the state to basically help expand their education and outreach. So they realized that as district employees, we're busy too. And sometimes it's hard to find direction. Sometimes it's hard to find the time. But most importantly, in a small district, especially, it's hard to find the money to set aside for some of these outreach things. So this is just kind of a few pieces that I, I cut off of that grant. If you haven't seen it, uh, the minimum request is $500. So it doesn't really take long to reach that. I mean, just with our pollinator beds, it that was just one component of the grant that we, or excuse me, the request that we put together last year, but it was just over $1,000. So, I mean, all we did was basically provide the labor for that. And then they do ask that, um, a final report is compiled at the end of that. And my last slide. 
Hannah. Uh, so one thing that I really appreciate about this grant is that it's, they designed it so that it's easy to fill out. So even if your district employee or as a district employee, you don't have a lot of experience with grant writing, this isn't meant to be a stickler and to trip somebody up who doesn't know how to write a grant. Like it's very straightforward. It's basically a one and a half page form to fill out. They usually release it shortly after the state convention in November. And then there's like a couple months before they have the deadline. And the, the other, the reason that I wanted to bring it just to, to the attention of everybody is that this past year, um, we didn't, there wasn't as many applicants as what the association was hoping for. So we just want to get the word out there and help districts realize that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So like Sean talked about the Soil Your Undies project. Well, maybe you want to do something like that. Like you're not going to be penalized just because you write a grant request for a project that somebody else already did. Like that's completely fine. The purpose behind it is to help soil conservation districts get their name out there in another avenue other than just tree planting or whatever other services you provide in your county. So please apply. <laughs> and with that, I will stop and we can ha have a little bit for a question and answer. Yeah, there is one question in the chat. Um, it's when do you clean out the plants for the year, fall or spring? Yep. So this past year, I left everything over winter. And like I had briefly mentioned, that was really cool to see, like when it had snowed, and then you'd go out there the next day, and you'd see all the little bird prints out there, because they were like, utilizing the seeds from those plants. And I went into those garden beds, just, I don't even know if it took me an hour, and it was probably... <laughs> middle spring I think it was about the beginning of May this year and just kind of cleaned up some of the dead um, debris that had fallen down and and whatever so that the new plants could push through so but because those pollinator beds are a little bit smaller that's also way easier to do because I can just kind of kneel at the edge and reach in far enough and so you're not yeah <laughs> I'm all about ease. So I'm just like, okay, whatever is the easiest. So, but yeah, in the spring. Awesome. Well, thank you, Tokina and Sean and Billy so much for sharing about your experiences and giving some advice to soil conservation district and employees and supervisors that are wanting to dip their toe into urban conservation. I think it's not quite as intimidating as one might think. And so I just really appreciate your perspective and experiences. Uh, like I said, I will be, this episode was, or webinar was recorded and we will be sharing that. And so I would also encourage you, I think this is a great webinar, whether it's for employees or supervisors. And so feel free to share it with folks that you think would appreciate and enjoy listening to this mash of ideas and sharing. And hopefully we will see several of you back next month in July as we talk about supervisor election process. And like I said, we'll have officials from the state office sharing about um, that process and what supervisors need to do to make sure that their name is on the ballot this fall. Have a great rest of your day and uh, thanks again. <laughs>